Today I'll be discussing to the evening star, a delightful sonnet by William Blake. Let us first look at uh, a short biography of the poet. William Blake was born on the 28th of November in 1757 in London and died on the 12th of August in 1827, also in London. Except for a brief period towards the latter part of his life, Blake spent his whole life in London. Blake grew up in what can be termed as modest circumstances. His mother was his teacher, and in, a late, in his later writing, Blake said, I quote, thank God I never was sent to school to be flogged into following the style of a fool, end quote. Blake was a man of many gifts. He was an engraver, an artist, a poet, and a visionary. Blake's life and works were intensely spiritual and bound closely with his visions. In fact, these visions were the inspiration of many of his literary works. He thought everyone had the ability to experience visions to begin with, but they lost it due to negligence. In his essay, A Vision of the Last Judgment, Blake wrote, I quote, I assert for myself that I do not behold the outward creation, end quote. In a letter to William Haley in 1802, Blake wrote, I quote, I'm under the direction of messengers from heaven daily and nightly, end quote. Commenting on her, her husband's preoccupation with visions to their friend uh, uh, Seymour Kirkup, Catherine Blake had once said, I quote, I have very little of Mr. Blake's company. He's always in paradise, end quote. Blake was officially a member of the Church of England. However, in a vision of the last judgment, Blake declared that the creator of this world, whom he called uh, Nobody Daddy, Nobody Daddy and Urizen was a cruel being. In his poem, The Everlasting Gospel, which was composed around 1818, Blake says, I quote, the vision of Christ that thou dost see is my vision's greatest enemy. Both read the Bible day and night, but thou readest black where I read white, end quote. Blake was against institutionalized religion which is so as doing the culture works for those in power. He denounced the unholy alliance between the state and the church in poems like London. For Blake, religion was a private matter which involved communion with the spirit. His short religious tracts include, there is no natural religion and all religions are one composed in 18, eight, uh, 1788. Blake wrote, a poet, uh, Blake wrote poetry from boyhood. In his capacity as a poet, he was the author of Songs of Innocence published in 1789 and Songs of Experience published in 1794. He was also the author of uh, prophecies such as Visions of Daughters of Albion, the first book of Urizen, Milton and Jerusalem. Together with his wife, Catherine, Blake ran a one-man publishing house for his literary work. First, he drew his poems on copper and etched them. Thereafter, he printed and colored them before stitching them into books, no more than a dozen at a time. Today, Blake is regarded by many literary critics to be the earliest and the most original of romantic poets. Yet, in his own lifetime, sadly, Blake was dismissed as mad. Readers of his work must pay close attention to the artwork that accompanies his poetry in order to comprehend the meaning of his work fully. For example, in London, the blind bearded poetic persona sees in every face marks of war and every voice mind forge manacles. It is said 
that plagues two most famous collections of poetry, Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience, deal with the two contrary states of human, the, the human soul. In Songs of Experience, Blake seems to be dealing with the human soul besieged by evil. With that in mind, let us read To the Evening Star by William Blake. To the Evening Star. Thou fair-haired angel of the evening. Now, while the sun's rest on the mountains, light thy bright torch of love, thy radiant crown put on, and smile upon our evening bed. Smile on our loves, and while thou drawest the blue curtains of the sky, scatter thy silver gem on every flower that shuts its sweet eyes in timely sleep. Let thy best wind sleep on the lake. Speak silence with thy glimmering eyes and wash the dusk with silver. Soon, full soon, dost thou withdraw. Then the wolf rages wide and then the lion glares through the dun forest. The fleece of our flocks are covered with thy sacred dew. Protect them with thine influence. Content-wise, to the evening star can be read as an ode to nature. Structurally, however, it is a sonnet. Blake directly addresses the evening star, making his poem an invocation, a prayer or a hymn. In that sense, the poet plays the role of a priest or a shepherd that prays for the well-being of his flock. There is a great distance between God and his believers in the institutionalized form of Christianity. But the kind of relationship the poetic persona has with the evening star is much more intimate as implied by the use of imperatives such as smile upon our evening beds, wash the dusk with silver and thy radiant crown put on. This is the kind of relationship Blake craved uh, for with religion. In this sonnet, Blake continues his preoccupation with the theme of the daily cycles as a metaphor for the innocence and experience. Light or daytime for Blake represent innocence, whereas darkness or night stands for forces that are evil. It is experience that gives one an awareness of their existence. Hence, Experience forces one to recognize that there is evil around us. In this sense, the poem is linked thematically to his other poems such as The Lamb, The Tiger, and The Garden of Love. Blake makes the evening star a bearer of a bright torch of love, thereby making it something bright and brave, a force that stands against forces of darkness and evil. The speaker calls upon the fair-haired angel of the evening to protect him and his loved ones against all that is evil, the wolves and the lions. Hence, the reign of the evening star is a period of struggle between light and darkness. The benevolent light of the sun is fading. Only the serene evening star stands as bulwark against the approaching darkness, albeit for a short period. The evening star combines all the benevolent elements of nature and creates a perfect moment of serenity and security. While the star shines brightly, the west wind that would bring icy rains and storms rests on the lake. The evening star, the goddess Venus, or more rightly her older and more powerful version, Aphrodite, is a classical female deity representing love, beauty, and fertility. The poet seems to be uh, distressed by the predatory nature of the relationships between men and women, as well as those of power, with power represented by wolves and lions, and those without power represented by sheep and lamb in society. He shows a similar sentiment on the issue of operations of power and male-female relations in his poem, London, 
in which he compares marriage bed to a hearse. In this poem, Blake expresses a longing for a more motherly, feminine approach to garments. He hopes that the warm, sacred dew, as opposed to cold, holy water dispensed by priest as a form of protection against evil, shed by the evening star, would protect his flocks from the predatory forces represented by wolves and lions that are out to kill them. Further, the poet is asking the evening star to bless his bed and smile on his loves in a capacity as a goddess of love and fertility. There are six main themes in this poem. Sociopolitical entrapment, pastoral simplicity, desire, innocence versus experience, and or light versus darkness, beauty of nature, and lastly, divinity. Looking at the first theme, the poem is about sociopolitical entrapment forcing people to look for alternatives. On the surface, the Victorian age was a time of rigid, rigidly defined institutions, may it be religion, government, education, or marriage. Everything and everyone was arranged according to rigidly upheld hierarchy. Any trespassers were cruelly punished as illustrated by some of Blake's own experiences. Many who were made miserable by such a way of life looked for alternative ways of existence as represented by the brief reign of the evening star. The lion and the wolf in this sonnet seem to stand for the clearly defined intolerant social political institutions of Blake's London. It is only during the brief period between the daytime and the night that the evening star or Venus could put on her radiant crown so that she could draw the curtain against the harsh light of the day, for the flowers to sleep and calm the wind. Her reign is a time away from time of color, peace and pleasure between two extremes, the harsh daytime and the dangerous nighttime. People made weary by the socio-political restrictions, poverty and corruption of the period found solace in her offerings. However, such undefinedness as hers is not tolerated by the rigid socio-political structures of the Victorian society. So she's forced to soon withdraw, leaving her devotees and, her and his flocks covered only with her dew for their protection against the dark forces of the encroaching night. Looking at the, the second theme, pastoral simplicity, the poet presents a picture of a very simple lifestyle in which people get up with the sun and go to sleep with the sun. They are, uh, they are shepherds looking after their flocks and they had simple needs. In the last two lines, the speaker as a shepherd appeals to the evening star to intercede and protect his flocks from the threatening forces of the night. Looking at the third theme, desire, Victorian society most severely frowned upon any free expressions of desire. So the poetic persona seeks the blessing of the evening star, which is another term for the planet Venus, which is named after the Roman goddess of erotic love and fertility. The church, on the other hand, considers desire sinful. Uh, theme number four, innocence versus experience, light versus darkness. The shepherd is aware of the presence of evil and darkness in the world. Therefore, he is a voice of experience. It is this knowledge that makes him invoke the benevolent maternal evening star as a talisman against the impending inevitable darkness. The evening star is a force of light and goodness that looks after those who are weaker, the wolves and the lions are the forces of darkness and evil. They are masculine in nature. Sociopolitically, 
powerful institutions like the government and the church are often seen as pitiless, devouring masculine institutions like by Blake. Beauty of nature. Throughout the poem, the evening star is described as something of extreme beauty, radiant beauty. Divinity. As a, as a last uh, theme, divinity, uh, seen in the evening star, is a motherly, caring form of divinity, as opposed to cold, distant form of divinity that governs the institutionalized church. Looking at the poetic devices, the absence of a rhyming scheme signals chaos. In the poem, the poet is dealing with the battle between light and darkness, good and bad, etc. Hence, it is appropriate that the poem has no discern discernible rhyming scheme. The use of invocation, thou fair haired angel of the evening, generates a sense of familiarity, closeness, approachability, which is something Blake, Blake believed he could not have with the God in the organized church. Black, uh, Blake pers personifies the evening star as a representation of the loving, fertile divine, the type of divinity Blake felt comfortable with. The lion and the wolves are symbols of oppression and evil, while the flock, the golden crown, the dew, and the torch of love are symbols of love. In this poem, day and night are used as metaphors for innocence and experience. In addition, the poet uses imperatives, smile, wash, uh, to generate a sense of approachability in the divine he chooses to worship. However, it must be noted that in the traditional Christian prayer to God that begins as our Father who art in heaven, two, the devotees use the imperative. However, the verbs used there do not lend themselves to warmth and familiarity as in this case. The use of uh, anastrophe or inversion where the words, bird order is reversed. I quote, thy radiant crown put on, end quote, helps to maintain the internal rhythm and at the same time highlight the brilliance of the crown the goddess is about to wear. The juxtaposition of darkness and light offer, uh, offers the reader an opportunity to have a better look at what is going on in both uh, going on in uh, both and then uh, both and then compare and contrast. Poet also makes use of a large number of visual images. Uh, in one, a beautiful golden-haired goddess uh, is wearing a crown. In the next, she is lighting a torch. The sun is resting on the mountains. The, the householders are in bed and the benevolent goddess draws the curtains to keep the outside world at bay. The wolves and the lions are lurking in the dark, away from the areas consecrated by the goddess, by, uh, by, uh, by the goddess. In the eighth line, the poet marks the volta, uh, marking the uh, the volta marks the change from day to night as well as innocence to experience by using long ominous sounds. Uh, uh, sounding vowel sounds such as soon, full, soon, uh, the poet generates a sonance. Uh, to end this discussion, I would like to leave you with some questions to ponder on. What type of poem is this? Why do you think the poet makes the angel fair haired? Why does the poet, poetic person warns the evening star, warn the evening star to light her torch while the sun rests on the mountain? 
what are the three things the poetic person is asking the evening star to do in the first four lines of the poem. The poet juxtaposes light and darkness throughout the poem. What are the words related to light the poet had used in the poem? What is the purpose of scattering silver dew? But you think the poet hopes to convey by using the adjective timely as a modifier for sleep. What is the meaning of the line? I quote, let the best wind sleep on the lake. End quote. What do you think the poetic person I hope to achieve by asking the evening star to wash the dark with silver? What happens as soon as the evening star withdraws? Why can't the wolf and the lions attack the flock? What is the rhyming scheme of the poem? Comment on the language of the poem. The eighth line marks the volta or the turning point of the poem. What happens to the atmosphere of the poem with the volta? Who do you think the word, uh, who do you think the, the words flowers and flocks stand for? Who do you think they refer to as, uh, who do you think are referred to as wolves and lions? As the 16th question, write an appreciation of the poem. Comment on the structure of the poem. Summary, give a summary of the poem, themes, and how the poet uses techniques to convey the themes. With that, I would like to mark the, the end of this discussion. Let us meet uh, in another uh, discussion of a delightful poem like this next time. Until then, goodbye.